We're going to look today at the cells, the basic functional unit of all life. begins with a single cell, and within the body we have trillions of cells that are functioning to essentially work to keep the entire body going. And so our entire organism has cells that are working in different functions, they're working in different organs, they're working in different tissues to allow for our entire body to undergo its normal functioning. And so when we look at a general cell here, we have all of the structures in a sense that for the most part can be found within a cell within the human body. And so we see very obvious things like the nucleus. And so we have the large structure there in the center. And this is generally the only thing that we can see oftentimes under the microscope is the nucleus itself. We have other things in terms of the structures that we can see within the uh, cells themselves, things like our endoplasmic reticulum, rough as well as smooth, we have our Golgi apparatus, we have mitochondria, we have things like lysosomes, some cells have microvilli to increase their surface area, all kinds of different structures that we can find within any given cell. When we were talking about what some of the necessary functions of life, we talked about the need for membranes and the need for boundaries. And this is where at the cellular level, this comes into play with the plasma membrane. And so the plasma membrane is going to essentially keep everything inside the cell in and everything outside the cell out. And so this is our barrier between intracellular and extracellular fluids that are there. Within that membrane we're going to have all kinds of different proteins and structures that are inside there and one of the more important ones is the glycocalyx and so this is a part of the cell that basically tells all other cells in the body that it's supposed to be there this is kind of like the name tag of the cells and so this is what allows our immune system to ignore all cells that are part of us and attack foreign matter so that they're going to attack viruses uh, bacteria, fungus, whatever it happens to be that shouldn't be within the cell. But that membrane isn't in a sense like a solid structure, it's actually a fluid mosaic as it's referred to and so it has two layers, so it has a double bilayer of lipids and this is a phospholipid bilayer. Um, it's made up of the large part phospholipids and then another big chunk is cholesterol and then we have different types of lipids and um, <clears throat> proteins that are going to be embedded into it as well. And so glycolipids uh, fall under the category of structures that can be bound to carbohydrates with them. We can have phospholipids um, that are there as well, and that makes up the large quantity of the entire cell. So when we look at this fluid mosaic that we have there, we can see that we have all of the phospholipid bilayers and so it has a head it has a tail and so the little heads that it has on it are polar and so we have those there these are hydrophilic heads and then the tails that they have are hydrophobic and so this is a hydrophobic uh, layer that is there the hydrophilic layer likes the water on the outside of the cell and the water that's on the inside of the cell. That's, so that's why it points towards either side of those. Versus the lipid layer in the middle is our hydrophobic area. It does not like to touch the water. We've got all kinds of different proteins embedded within the membrane. Um, some of them go through the entire membrane. Some of them are just on one side of the membrane. <clears throat> we have our glycolipids here, and so we have our name tag portion and then you see all the little yellow structures all of the cholesterol that's found within the membrane itself those different kinds of proteins that are there serve different functions and have different jobs depending upon what kind of cell they're in they can do everything from joining two cells together and so helping to make a very uh, tight connection between the two cells they can help with moving substances in between the cells and so we can have transport. This can get nutrients into the cell. This can get hormones into the cell. All depends on what kind of thing we're, we're moving. 
Sometimes these things move passively, no energy required. Sometimes they require energy, our ATP for our cells. From there we have things that serve as enzymes or catalysts for chemical reactions. So it can bind to it and then we cause a chemical reaction to occur. We talked a little bit about our cell to cell recognition. So this becomes our glycocalyx there. And so on the, the outer portion here in a sense, this cell is an immune cell. And then this cell here would be our uh, body cell. And as long as those structures in a sense meet together, and so as long as the, the two of them have the ability to kind of talk to one another in a sense, uh, they're going to allow it to survive. Other signal, other uh, receptors receive signals. This could be from things like neurons. So we can have our neurotransmitter bind to the cell. This can be for things like hormones binding to the outside of the cell as well. Other structures attach and help to give form to the cell. So they become part of what we call a cytoskeleton. And so this skeleton, so to speak, that is in the cells allows us to maintain the shape of the cell. So the plasma membrane is going to be different depending upon the type of cell that we have, depending upon the function of that cell, what it needs to do. And with that, we may have more proteins, we may have less proteins, we may have one kind of protein, but not another. It all just depends upon what that cell's job is to be able to do. But as much as 20% of, or sometimes more, of the membrane is cholesterol. So that means that cholesterol is actually a, a vital substance that we have to have within our cells in order for them to function normally. Those junctions in between the cells that I said can help to hold the cells together. And so we have one of three kinds. We have tight junctions, we have desmosomes, and we have gap junctions. And so tight junctions are kind of like welding the two cells together. And so it makes it impermeable in between the two cells. Desmosomes hold the two cells together, but there's a little bit of space in between the cells. They also have structures extending out from them uh, that are going to allow for stabilization of the cell membrane as well. And then we have gap junctions. Gap junctions are kind of similar to that of a tight junction in that they kind of weld the two cells together, but they don't hold the two plasma membranes uh, very tightly together within the cell. So things can slip in between those gap junctions. Gap junctions also happen to have a pore in the middle. And so they allow for substances to move from one cell to the next. So here we can see we have tight junction and that tight junction is going to essentially make it impermeable for substances to move in between. So there's very little space in between the two cells. Desmosomes allow for that intercellular space. So some substances can slip in between those two cells. So whereas tight junctions, we're going to use those in places like the skin, the digestive tract, where we want to have a impermeable membrane there. Desmosomes we can use on other cells in other places of the body itself. And so that can be utilized elsewhere. And you can see here that we have those intermediate filaments being part of the cytoskeleton extending out from them. And then lastly, the gap junction. So the gap junctions have pores inside them. And so it's going to allow one cell to transmit a substance to the next cell. So this can move from the cell, we can move substances like sodium and potassium. And, and what we'll look at is the use of it for things like calcium. And so we can move calcium from one cell to the next. That movement of substances in between from one cell to the next can be done in a couple of different ways. And regardless of whether we use passive transport or active transport, the overriding principle is oftentimes going to be that we're going to move down a concentration gradient. We're going to go from one side of the membrane that has a lot to the other side of the membrane that has very little. But sometimes with active transport, we can move those substances not just down their gradient, but also against their gradient. And so make it go to where we already have too much of it, and we're going to make it concentrated even further. So simple diffusion is, in a, as the, the name kind of implies, relatively simple. And so it just goes right through 
the lipid bilayer. And so it's going from higher concentration towards lower concentration, getting from one side of the membrane to the other. It doesn't require any kind of special structures for the most part, um, but it can use protein channels. But oftentimes it just goes right through that the phospholipid bilayer. From there we have facilitated diffusion. And so for facilitated diffusion, this is going to allow us to transport substances that might be a little bit larger. And so these are going to, again, use a protein channel, but no energy is going to be required to do so. They're simply going to follow their concentration gradient to get to the other side. And those protein channels are oftentimes what we call carrier proteins, and that these carrier proteins are specifically designed for a particular substance. And so we got a diagram of them. So here we have our carrier protein. And inside that carrier protein, you can see that it has kind of a special shape to it. That special shape to it is only going to fit this particular substance. And so that particular substance can go into that uh, protein channel. And when it does so, it makes the protein channel change shape so that it dumps our substance into the inside of the cell. With simple diffusion, it just simply goes right through that lipid bilayer. It doesn't require any kind of special process to get inside. So the majority of our substances travel across the membrane. We just follow that passive transport and all is good. With water, things go a little bit differently. And so water moves via, via a passive transport called osmosis. And so it kind of breaks some of the rules because for passive transport to occur, it generally has to be a lipid soluble substance, but water is not lipid soluble. Think about mixing oil and water together and they don't mix. We can't get them to come together. And so oil and water doesn't mix. So that means that water shouldn't be able to go through the phospholipid bilayer. But water has a lot of interesting characteristics to it, which allows it to be able to move across this membrane that's there. But it's still going to follow concentration gradients. And so depending upon how that concentration goes is going to dictate kind of which direction it moves. So when it moves across the membrane, it's going to follow the concentration gradient. And so we're going to look at the osmolarity that's there of our uh, solutions. And so when we look at this side here, we have a uh, low concentration of solute on this side, a high concentration of solute on this side. And if the solute can move, it will. It always wants to balance it out so that we have the same number. So say we have 10 over here, we're going to have 10 molecules over here the concentration is going to be the same on either side. But the solute moved. And so we were able to get that solute to move through that membrane. So if the membrane is permeable to the solute that is in excess, so over here we had the, the excess on this particular side, it's going to want to move to the other side. It's going to go from the higher concentration to the lower concentration until it equalizes. If that membrane is not permeable to our solute, so if our solute can't get through that membrane, the water will. And so the water is going to move through that membrane and it's going to want to go towards the other side. So now we have two, four, six over here and we've got somewhere in the neighborhood of double or so, 12 or so on the other side. We'll just say that it's double. So the solutes, we have a higher concentration over here. So the water is going to want to move toward that higher concentration of solute. But if we think about it in terms of the water, the water basically has a lower concentration on this side. So we have a decrease in our water concentration over here, and we have an increase in water concentration over here. So the water is going to want to move from the the lower concentration to the higher, con from the, the high concentration to the lower concentration. So the water, once again, wants to move to the other side. And that's what we find happens. And so the water moved through our column, 
moving to the side of lower water concentration, and it then made it so that we were finally equal on both sides in terms of the concentration that's there. And so this happens all the time. We've seen this happen before, even in like our own bodies. You go and you go to the, the shower or to a bath and you're in there for too long. And all of a sudden we start to absorb the water that's in the bath. And so our fingers start to turn all pruney and things like that because of the amount of water that's in the, the tub itself. It's a, a higher concentration of water compared to what we have inside our body. So it moves from the bath into, the, into our skin. And so it moves in that direction of high concentration towards low. And that allows for us to move things within the body itself as well. And so we can move things around within the body. And so we can transport water. We can have the movement of water from one side to the next. We can create not just this gradient of water, but we all can also create high pressure and low pressure areas of the water and the solutes as well. And that's what we're going to utilize for filtration in places like the kidneys. When we have this difference in concentration between the two sides, we end up having a situation where we can give a term to that concentration. And so we either have isotonic, hypertonic, or hypotonic types of concentrations. And so with that, we have different components that are going to happen to the cells themselves. And so if we put a cell in an isotonic solution, we're going to get one result. And so in an isotonic solution, basically, Nothing's going to happen to the cell. It's going to remain the same. We put it into a hypertonic solution, and now the solution outside of the cell has a higher concentration of solutes. But since we can't move the solute, the water is going to move. And so the water is going to move from where we have low concentration to where we have higher concentration of the solutes. And so that's going to cause the cell to start to shrivel up. And then in hypotonic solutions, this is like putting a cell in pure water. And so with a hypertonic or a hypotonic solution, uh, this is similar to again going into the bathtub for too long or into the pool for too long. The water is going to start to move into the cells because the, the water outside has a lower solute concentration compared to the inside of the cells. And so an isotonic solution will give us a cell that basically remains the same. A hypertonic solution is going to start to shrivel ourselves up or crenate them. And then a hypotonic solution is going to cause them to swell and potentially burst. And so it may cause those cells to actually rupture. One of the most important structures that we have in our cells as far as uh, protein structures goes is what's called a sodium potassium pump. And so sodium potassium pumps allow for us to move sodium and potassium in opposite directions of one another. And so with this, we're going to move three sodiums out of the cell and two potassium into the cell. And so we're going to be constantly moving sodium out of the cell and we move potassium into the cell. And this is going to create a gradient. So where we have lots and lots of sodium outside of the cell and then we have kind of a large amount of potassium inside the cell. So if the, the sodium is in greater quantity outside of the cell, it's going to want to get inside. But the thing is when we just allow it to kind of do it on its own, Sodium doesn't leak in back very well. And so it doesn't come back into the cell very easily. Potassium gets out a lot easier than sodium leaks in. And we can use that since sodium is charged. We can use that movement of sodium rushing back into the inside of the cell eventually. If we put another channel there that opens up very quickly, that creates an electrical charge. And so we'll come back to this sodium potassium pump when we start to talk about muscles as well as the So the sodium potassium pump is an example of an active transport. And so we have to actively use ATP, our body's energy source, in order to get that sodium potassium to move in and out of the cell. 
So types of active transport, the sodium potassium pump would be a primary active transport. And so ATP is being used. We're hydrolyzing the ATP into ADP and inorganic phosphate. And that process is an active process. But since we pump with the sodium potassium pump and move, if this is our cell here, we move that sodium to the outside of the cell. And so now that sodium is outside of the cell. That sodium wants to come back in. Since the sodium wants to get back in, if we've got another substance like glucose that would like to come back in also, we can essentially use a sodium glucose transporter to get both of them into the cell. And so now all of a sudden, both our sodium and the glucose come back into the cell. And this is a secondary active transport. We've already set up the situation where we've got sodium outside of the cell. And so this is similar to if we had a, like a water tower. We take the water tower and we pump all the water up to the top of the water tower. And then when we need the water, it's already ready and there with high amount of pressure to come out of the tap. We don't have to pump it up at that moment. We've already done the work in order to set up this system. This glucose sodium transporter is an example of a symport. Two substances move in the same direction, so either into the cell or out of the cell at the same time. But we can also have an antiport system, and the antiport system would be like our sodium and potassium pump. And so the two of them would uh, be able to move in opposite directions. So here we have our um, sodium potassium pump and a glucose pump as well. And so sodium is coming out of the cell, potassium coming into the cell. And now that we've got that sodium outside of the cell in larger quantities than it is inside, and so there's more sodium out here than there is on the inside, the sodium wants to come back in. And so we can use this, this uh, protein pump here and join with a glucose. And now both of them fit inside there. So our glucose looking something like that, our little sodium being all round in there. And once the two of them get into that little channel, then the both of them are going to come back into the inside of the cell. And so we have our uh, sim port over here, and we have our anti port over here. At times, we need to move very large substances in or out of the cell. And so what we're going to create are what are called vesicles. And so we're going to create kind of like a bubble inside the cell. And so when we want to move substances out of the cell, we're going to use exocytosis. So something that's already inside the cell, we need to get it out. Uh, we utilize exocytosis. If we want to get something into the inside of the cell, we're going to endocytose it. So we're going to bring it into the inside of the cell in a bubble. And that's going to come into the cell. Uh, we can move those vesicles around via transcytosis. And so we can move substances um, into and across the cell and then out of the cell. So kind of like with digestion, it's going to come in through the cell and make its way through the cell to the other side. We can also move them around just from one part of the cell to another. For certain of our cells, our white blood cells, they have the ability to do what's called phagocytosis. And so phagocytosis is going to be where essentially they eat other things like bacteria or viral infected cells, tumor cells, things like that. And when they do so, they're going to phagocytose them. And so the cell itself sends out little pseudopods and our little particle out here ends up getting engulfed into the cell. And so those little pseudopods extend outward until they eventually engulf that substance into the inside of the cell. When we move things through the cell um, with our vesicular transport, they're gonna be done so in kind of different phases as they move through. And so the initial process is where the plasma membrane 
is going to have to all of a sudden invaginate. And so it's going to fold in on itself once it's inside there. From there, the two sides of that pit eventually close in on each other. And now we've got a vesicle on the inside of the cell um, that's there. And so this allows for us to then grab onto this with special motor proteins and kind of transport it to the other side of the cell that's there. And so we're able to move it across by itself. So here we have an example of exocytosis. We've got some sort of substance that we need to get out of the cell. Maybe this is a hormone and we're going to exocytose it. This little bubble is going to come out and open up and allow for all that substance to leave the cell. Endocytosis is basically this in reverse. The little green particles would be coming in. They would get enveloped into a vesicle. It would then detach from the plasma membrane and we'd bring it into the inside of the cell. So many different processes for uh, transport itself. Some of them require no energy. And so we basically just have kinetic energy involved. The energy is already there in the concentration. That's there. But many of the processes need energy. We need ATP in order to get those substances to move across the membrane itself. And so lots and lots and lots of, of energy required in order to get different types of processes to move from one side to the other. When we have this concentration gradient, so when we have a substance that is in excess quantity on one side or the other, and so when we have an excess amount of sodium on one side of that membrane, that sodium wants to get to the inside. And when it does so, that means that we have excess sodium on the outside. That means the inside of the cell is going to be negative. And so a positive and a negative kind of sounds like something like a battery. And so that's exactly what we have inside our own cells in certain places. And so they actually generate a voltage. It's a very small voltage. We're talking millivolts, uh, but it does have the ability to set off an electrical impulse. And so this is one of the, the specific things that has to occur in order for muscles and nerves to be able to fire off what we call an action potential. That's there. And so we can use this concentration gradient that we have set up in order to give us that uh, gradient that we need in order to have electrical impulses on there. And so, and it's not just sodium potassium, it's everything that has a charge. So there's chloride ions, um, potassium ions, sodium ions. There's even proteins have a charge to them. And so we add up all of the charges and on the inside of the cell, we have a relative negative charge. And on the outside of the cell, we have a relative positive charge. And as soon as we start to allow that sodium to rush to the inside of the cell, this is going to start to give off that voltage change that's there. And so we're going to have a, a discharge of that voltage as it comes across, kind of like charging a battery and then instantly discharging it and then charge it back up again and then instantly discharge it. For cells to be able to be held together, um, we have what we call cell adhesion molecules. Not only do they help to kind of hold the cells together, but it also helps with movement of certain cells in between those cells. And so it's going to allow the cells to move past one another uh, as far as their ability to kind of slide past one another. And so our white blood cells, as they move into tissues that have become injured or infected, they're going to be able to slide through all of those individual cells and get to the area of injury or infection and clean everything up. Different receptors provide for different uh, processes within the cells themselves. And so with some of them, we have what we call contact signaling. And so the cells themselves um, essentially touch one another and this can limit their growth or their movement depending upon what's going on. Uh, we can have electrical signaling. Uh, this is more rare, but this does occur with the nervous system especially. 
And so we can have one nerve communicate with another simply by giving off an electrical discharge. We can also have chemical signaling, one of the more uh, important processes that occurs. And so we have things like neurotransmitters, and then we also have things like hormones. And so both of those use a chemical signal in order for them to send their signal within the, the body itself. And then, especially with things like hormones, oftentimes they use what's called a G protein linked receptor. And so this doesn't provide for an instant activity in the, the cell, but it does provide for a long term type of a uh, signaling to be propagated in the receptor cell itself. And so G proteins we'll come back to when we get into the, the nervous system again. Um, but the basics of the G protein linked receptor is that we've got some sort of first chemical. And so typically this is a hormone, something like that, or a, um, a neurotransmitter. It binds to a receptor on the surface of the cell and that sets off a chemical reaction, our G protein. And so the receptor is bound to a G protein and that sets off a chemical reaction that eventually leads to the activation of a second messenger. And so that second messenger is things like cyclic AMP. It can be things like calcium. It can be uh, cyclic GMP rather than cyclic AMP. Uh, all kinds of different substances can be utilized for that second messenger. But once we get that second messenger, the big thing is that we get a huge amount of cellular response, more so than what we would have gotten with a instant process. And so this requires us to have a little bit slower mechanism, but we're going to get a much longer effect from the process. So now to look at some of the things that we find inside of the cell. And so we have things like the cytoplasm, and so everything that is the content between the plasma membrane and the nuclear envelope is our cytoplasm. This contains cytosol, uh, which is primarily water, but it's basically anything that can be dissolved in water um, that's inside the cell. So it's proteins, it's salts, it's sugars, it's minerals of different kinds and so on. Whatever that cell is going to utilize within it. There also may be some waste products and things like that. Floating inside the water portion are organelles. And so we have different kinds of organelles that are found within the, the cells themselves, and they function in different aspects, uh, depending upon what's needed in that particular cell, uh, tells us what those organelles are doing there. We also have other substances called inclusions. We'll come across this when we look at the skin. And so we'll have things like pigments inside them in muscles, We'll start to see them in glycogen and so they can be just simply other substances that are larger than what can be dissolved in the fluid the organelles themselves come in basically two major com uh, components either membranous or non-membranous depending upon whether the the structure itself is has a membrane or not so mitochondria are one of the more important components that we have within the cells themselves, they manufacture ATP. And so ATP is our body's universal energy source. Um, although we, in a sense, need and we think of things like carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids as being the things that we consume, all of that gets essentially converted into ATP. And so we're going to use them for energy. We're going to convert it over into ATP within the cells themselves. One of the unique things about ATP is that it contains its own DNA and RNA. And the more interesting side of it is not just that it contains its own genetic material, but that that genetic material is actually passed down on the maternal side. So it comes from mom. Uh, and so our, all of our mitochondria are derived from mom's DNA rather than a combination like normally happens within cells. 
We then have ribosomes. And so ribosomes are a non-membranous type. Um, this is the site of protein synthesis. That's what's happening inside those cells and so, uh, or inside the, the ribosomes. And so ribosomes are there for uh, protein synthesis. They can either be free ribosomes or more often they are membrane bound. And so they're gonna be bound up to, to a membrane. Oftentimes that membrane is endoplasmic reticulum. And so endoplasmic reticulum has two kinds, either smooth endoplasmic reticulum or rough endoplasmic reticulum. And you can see the difference between the two. The rough endoplasmic reticulum has all of these ribosomes on them. And so it's studded with all of those ribosomes, making it rough. And depending upon the cell, is gonna dictate how much of that rough ER we have or how much smooth ER we have, or if we have any at all. So rough endoplasmic reticulum's job is essentially protein synthesis. And so the ribosomes are making the proteins, but the rough endoplasmic reticulum is going to package them up. And so it's gonna be all of our secreted types of proteins, all the proteins that are gonna leave the cell are gonna be uh, packaged up here. And so the, the proteins are going to be made to go out to the edge of the cell and then potentially be released. Other proteins like integral membrane proteins are going to be just incorporated into the cell membrane itself. Um, it also produces the phospholipids for the bilayer. Smooth endoplasmic reticulum doesn't have a set job. And so its job is dependent upon the cell that it's in. And so in places what like what we'll talk about is in skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle, its job is storage. And so it's gonna store calcium inside the, the cells themselves. But in places like the liver, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is there for detoxification. It's there for being able to break down glycogen. And so when we have excess amounts of glucose, that glucose gets stored away as glycogen. And then we've got to be able to release that glycogen back out and break it down. Um, that's there. Uh, it also does detoxification of things like drugs that we take or chemicals that we ingest, things like that. Uh, in other places, we have things like the testes in males. Uh, this is where smooth endoplasmic reticulum is going to be utilized for the production of hormones. And so the uh, testosterone and all of its derivatives are produced by smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And then in the digestive tract, um, these smooth endoplasmic reticulum are going to be utilized for the digestive process itself, everything from absorption to transporting lipids from one side of the membrane to the other. Most proteins that get manufactured in the rough endoplasmic reticulum get then shipped over to the Golgi apparatus. And so the Golgi apparatus is going to take the proteins that came from the rough endoplasmic reticulum or from ribosomes themselves, and it's basically going to package them up. And so its job is packaging, concentration, and modification. And so proteins that come out of the rough endoplasmic reticulum or um, from ribosomes themselves are not like ready to go. And so think about it like in a manufacturing plant. In a manufacturing plant, you make the product, I believe that, um, you make the product over here in the rough ER, and then we're gonna send that product. So now we've got a product and it's just sitting there in a sense on the assembly line. Now we're gonna ship it over in a container over to the packaging line. And in the packaging line, we're gonna take, you can kind of see there's different colors of substances here. And we're gonna take all of the dark ones and package them all together. And then we're gonna take all of the light blue ones and package all of them together. So we're concentrating the amount of the, or the, the type of the protein into each of the vesicles that's going to go from there. So we have this pathway basically going from the nucleus through the rough ER, through the Golgi apparatus, 
and then potentially out of the cell, depending upon what that substance is. Or sometimes those cells, be, those vesicles become part of the cell. We might be doing repair, we might be doing growth, and they're utilized in that fashion as well. In things like white blood cells, we're going to create lysosomes that are going to be able to break down whatever it was that we brought into the cell. So if this is like a little bacteria inside here, we can destroy that bacteria using that lysosome. Lysosomes themselves are basically digestive enzymes. And so they're utilized to digest bacteria, viruses, toxins. So when we have some sort of infection, um, whether it be from a bacteria or a virus, the white blood cells are going to use their lysosomes to destroy them, to break them down. In other places in the body that we'll talk about in terms of the bone is we use osteoclasts to release lysosomes to literally dissolve our bone so that we're able to, to take the, the calcium back out into the bloodstream and get it moving from there uh, to wherever it needs to go. Unlike per, uh, lysosomes, peroxisomes are a little bit different. So lysosomes are meant to break down things that we find kind of in the cells, around the cells, things like that. Uh, peroxisomes are designed to do detoxification. And more so, they're going to do things for that we find called free radicals. And so free radicals are oftentimes um, substances that are going to either accept or donate an unpaired electron, which means that we could potentially cause damage to things like our nucleus and our DNA. And we don't want that. And so uh, peroxisomes are used for that breakdown of free radicals. And how we do that is by doing things like consuming substances that have the ability to deal with this oxidative stress. And so we're going to break down that uh, component within the potentially within the cells or surrounding the cells, wherever that thing happened to be from, whether it was from our food, whether it's from the air, whether it was from a bacteria or a virus, whatever it happens to be, we can destroy that per particular substance. So when we eat, we look for things that are antioxidants. And those are the things that are going to help with uh, building peroxisomes that have the ability to deal with free radicals. So the endomembrane system is that system of getting our code for our protein from the nucleus out through the rough endoplasmic reticulum, through the, the Golgi apparatus, and then sending that substance to wherever it needs to go inside the cell and moving it on from there. And that's where we'll stop and start up in the next set of lecture.